The, oh man, Starfield on Starfield on Starfield, Chris. <laughs> yeah, can't do that. All right. Ooh, you're basically a floating head. That one suits. That one's better. <laughs> this is a cool one. That is very cool. The moon and Mars. But it's not relevant to what we're doing. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's okay. Let's, we'll do this. <laughs> there we go. All right. We're live on YouTube now as well. So, we are ready to go. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start off the way that I start off every single time, which is, hi, everybody. Welcome to the folks on Zoom. Welcome to the folks on YouTube. A reminder that if you are on Zoom and you want to talk to everyone, um, just change that little bar that says all panelists in the chat to say all panelists and attendees, and then you'll be able to see uh, what everyone is saying. Uh, this is um, the last session that we have scheduled, but we will be continuing to run the sessions um, starting again on November 17th. So we're taking a break in two weeks, I believe is our plan, right, Chris? Sure, that would help. Yeah, probably for the best. <laughs> um, to reset, refresh, come back strong. Come back strong. So we'll, we'll, uh, we will be sharing with you the records of our universe, our universe uh, today, and then we will come back again starting in, uh, in mid-November. I do also want to take a moment to let folks know, because I know there are a lot of folks watching the show that wanted to see more about Indigenous astronomy. And there is an Indigenous astronomy event happening on Friday. And that event is with Native Sky Watchers um, and NASA. They're working together to bring the event uh, live on YouTube. I will send out the website with more information in the chat and on the YouTube uh, chat as well. They actually have multiple projects going forward. Um, so they've got uh, seven different seasonal live virtual shows um, about seven different uh, indigenous astronomy, uh, seven different indigenous cultures and their astronomy. So Ojibwe first, then Lakota Dakota, uh, Maya, and Meso Maya and Mesoamerican, um, Navajo, Diné, African, Hawaiian, and then one last one. So uh, they've got lots coming up. Check that out if you're interested. The link is in the Zoom chat and it'll be in the YouTube chat. Um, and now let's go back to the topic at hand, uh, which is Guinness out of this world records. This world records. So uh, just to, just to, you know, put, put a qualifier on some of the, so some of this is legit known records from data and some of it's going to be perhaps a bit of opinion um, we might ask the audience for a little bit of input too. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm really trying to say is that if, if I suggest or we suggest something is the record and you've heard differently, that there might be reasons. There might be because scientists aren't really sure. They're still in the process of discovering more data, more information about an object. Um, things like biggest, biggest, oldest, brightest, longest, they, they do, the lists do change over time. So you may have a book that says it's one thing. I often go to schools and, and somebody puts up their hand and a young boy or a girl says, did you know what the biggest star is? And they'll, they'll name the star and I'll probably mention it as well as we go. Um, but when I did my research, sadly, that star is no longer the record holder. So they need to get a fresh book or, <laughs> or watch this video. So in, so in all fairness, started. that's what that's what happens with the Guinness World Book of Records, right? More people come along and they break the records. In this case, we're just finding out more and it's breaking the yeah, records. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen, bring up Stellarium as we always do, because that's fun. And we'll go from here. So my first topic is, oh, where's my Stellarium gone? Here we go. My first topic is the largest constellation. So when, you, when we talk about the size of constellations, we're talking about the area of sky that they're covering in square degrees. And it can be a little bit tricky to think about, well, how many square degrees is that? But the, the easy way to do it is, is our old friend, our fist at arm's length. So you hold your fist at arm's length and close one eye. And that, your hand, your closed fist should cover an area, well, a, a diameter of about 10 degrees. So 10 degrees left, right, 10 degrees up, down. And it's roughly a square fist. So a 10 by 10, that's 100 degrees. So your fist covers 100 square degrees of sky. So the largest constellation, I every, now there are 88 constellations in the sky. Each has a defined, recognized boundary. 
which I'm showing you here in red. And you can see some are tiny, some are big, um, some are funny. I mean, Vulpecula here, <laughs> the, the main stars stick figure is tucked into the corner of this big area that's all assigned to Vulpecula. So there's funny things like that that happen, but mm. there are reasons. Uh, but anyway, the largest constellation by area in the sky is called Hydra. Hydra is the water snake, and it covers 1,303 square degrees. So 13 fists, everybody got together and all put their fists together. Wow. Um, it's not a very prominent constellation. It's sort of a spring constellation. Let me bring it up to springtime and around the beginning of spring at 10 o'clock. There you go. So here's Hydra. And it starts here and it winds all the way around, does a little bit of a, the way you connect the dots is passed through the left of the border, but that's okay. And ends up here. So we've got the tail and we've got the head at the other end and measuring in degrees, kind of east and west, it's about 90 plus degrees east, west. And it's about 42 degrees north, south, but we only count the area inside the, the crooked boundary and that's 1303. So that's the biggest one. There, the smallest one, go ahead. Can I, can I throw in something that I learned real quick? I promise I won't take long. Um, I was doing a, a show about constellations specifically in um, last year or so. Um, and I had a book from our historian from, of constellations in the 1800s. And there was a massive constellation, which I would guess might be bigger than Hydra. Of course, we're not talking about 1800s constellations right now, um, called Argo, which yeah. has now been split up into three constellations. But at the we're time- gonna, We're going there. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead, <laughs> finish the thought. Um, but yeah, it, it used to be like the ship from, I believe, Jason and the Argonauts. And it took up some massive portion of the sky. And now they've split it up into three much smaller uh, constellations. So that's a great segue because the smallest constellation is Crux, the Southern Cross. So let's oh. let's head to the Southern Hemisphere. And those who watched our tour down under would have been exposed to the Southern Cross. And we just bring up the sky at night here, in the Southern Hemisphere. So where are we at here? Here's Crux. So Crux is this little rectangular area. This is not the best time of year to see Crux because it's like our, like in Canada right now, the Big Dipper is, is sort of scratch scooping along the Northern horizon. For those who live in the Southern hemisphere, Crux is currently sliding along the Southern hemisphere. But if we advance a few months, we can bring Crux nice and high in the sky. And here's what you're talking about, Jenna. Here's Puppas, Carina and Vela. These three together make this big ship. Right, yeah, you can, you can see it really well, actually, with the yeah, outline. that's there. the sail. Yeah, that's the main keel. And there's the, the stern of the ship huh. and the prow. So that's them. But they've been broken up into three separate constellations now. So here's Crux. Crux is the Southern Cross. It's so famous that this, this set of stars appears on many flags of many countries in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, and so on and so on. Some of the, um, the small Pacific Island countries because it's such a very famous and distinctive constellation. So it covers only um, 68 square degrees, but as you can, as you can sort of imply here, infer, we can't see it from Canada. But in Canada, we can see the next two smallest constellations. And let me just wind back to home and go back to the evening sky. And the next two smallest constellations after Crux, are up here near, whoops, let me scoot around here to find. We're in February right now, February of 2021. Yeah, that's why I'm yeah. confused. <laughs> here we go back, uh, up near Pegasus. So we have Pegasus, and then we have the little wee baby horse, Equulius. This is the baby horse. I can just bring up the picture. Well, there you can see it here. Uh, it's only 72 square degrees, so it's just four square degrees larger than Crux. And then we have Sagitta, the arrow, is the third in line, and it's at uh, 80 square degrees. So those are visible right now in our sky. That's kind of, that's a nice comparison because I've never seen 
crux nor paid attention much to the southern sky but it looked fairly large it's hard to tell when like depending on where it is in the on the in the sky in stellarium it can look smaller or larger um Mm -hmm. but knowing that Aquilius is beside Pegasus and we know how giant Pegasus is that's a really nice comparison yeah um and Pegasus I mean it's it's even it's even bigger than um, than Cygnus so it's it's among the top the top five or something like that Mm -hmm. okay now this one this is one of the arguably ones. so what do you think is the brightest constellation oh like overall yeah what would you call what would you what would you say is the brightest constellation? Uh, is it like all of the added magnitudes of every single star in the constellation? Well, that's what makes it tricky. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give you my answer in a minute, but. Uh, throw your answers in the chat. If you guys have guesses, please throw them in the chat because I don't want to be alone while I'm trying to guess these things. For now, I'm going to guess what has a lot of bright stars. Um, Leo has a good number of bright stars. Orion has lots of bright stars. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of people are saying Orion. Yeah. So I I argue that it's Orion. Um, the stars that we see in the winter sky tend to be um, the bright, real jewels of the winter sky. I don't know whether it's partly because the air is nice and crisp and dark and, and how that might work. But um, Orion, I think, could be argued as as the brightest constellation. I think I think a lot of people might answer... The Big Dipper, remember, but remembering, of course, the Big Dipper is just a piece of the bigger constellation called called um, Ursa Major. Mm-hmm. But what I did is I looked at I looked at the list of the top brightest stars in the sky, and I looked at how many of those stars were in each of the constellations. And it turns out that Orion and where is it here, Crux mm. and Canis Major, the big dog. Of course, each, yeah. Yeah, where Sirius is, each contain at least two of the top twenty-two brightest stars. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out and say that for me, it's Orion. Mm-hmm. Um, Canis Major is certainly dominated by Sirius, but um, you could argue Orion, you could argue Canis Major, or maybe even uh, Crux if you're from the Southern Hemisphere, where it is definitely a very, a very uh, dominant constellation. All right. So then, hmm. what's the most famous constellation? Ooh, I would say Orion or, well, cause it doesn't, cause asterisms don't count, eh? Well, but do they? So, <laughs> but do so they? what most people would sort of immediately answer is probably the Big Dipper. Yeah. And that's, you, you nailed it. The Big Dipper is actually not a constellation. It's called an asterism. So it's actually an informal pattern of stars that are strung together. Um, in this case, a part of a bigger constellation, but you can also put put asterisms together um, that are um, combining constellations. We'll come back to that in a minute. So, so yeah. So I think I mean I think probably the consensus would be Orion for his belt, and I think the Big Dipper, even though it's it's not an it's not a constellation in the in the traditional sense but in in both those cases people really recognize the big dipper and the belt which are both asterisms and are both single uh, are all contained within one constellation so i agree with your i think that counts yeah yeah they've got very recognizable features that help you find them and i think that's the key to it is to help you get outside and orient yourself and know where things are at Mm -hmm. all right so so what about the oldest constellation what do you think is the oldest now obviously the stars (laughs) the stars predate humans so the stars have always been there and they've always sort of been more or less where we see them. Uh, they do very, they do very slowly change their position, but basically for all intents and purposes, the sky we see now is the same sky that, that our ancestors saw. So, but what do you think would be the oldest constellation sort of of our list of constellations? And that's, there's an asterisk on that as well. But. Unlike the ones that are in the sky right now, yeah. I would, I would say that, yeah. Oh, um, Danielle says Ursa Minor. I'm thinking maybe Ursa Major because it's so bright. Bruce says Virgo. Well, um, I can make the argument that it's actually Taurus. Oh. And the reason I'm going to suggest that it's Taurus. So here we've got, here we have Taurus. It's got the triangle shaped face. He's got the Pleiades up here, kind of over his shoulder. Right. And then he's got Orion's belt. And Orion down below it. Take a look at this picture. 
if I can open this picture for us. Do you see that picture? Oh, yeah. This is a cave painting from the, from the Lascaux Caves. This painting is 17,000 years old. And there are Whoa. people who there are people who suggest that this this is called an auroch a u r o c h that's the, the name of the animal. There are people who suggest that this auroch is not just any auroch, but that it's Taurus, and that this is the Pleiades, and this is Orion's that's, belt. <gasps> that's so cool. So, arguably, there there are people who would argue that this could be the earliest earliest known. Um, depiction of a constellation. Um, and there are actually, there are other more Neolithic ones, prehistoric ones that may be less, uh, less obvious, but I think this is a really cool one. So it's so also like now, a really nicely drawn bull yeah. that the animal would have name, name of which I've forgotten already. Um, but it's like a really nicely drawn bull too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, that the, the artist was extremely talented. And of course it's fascinating to read up on, on cave art. And there are lots of other cases. So, but so, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say Taurus. And of course we, we have to stop and say, it's likely that many indigenous cultures around the world have their own patterns in the sky that they saw and easily pre could predate, you know, our constellations, our Western constellations, and even, even this one. So those, those are lost to history, but it's fun to talk about and, and research this kind of thing. And I'll briefly plug, um, a book that we have actually that we that is written by the people who are hosting the event on Friday that I mentioned, um, which is Ojibwe constellations. And so, if you're interested in reading about those, um, I will link that book. Uh, yeah, I, I actually yeah. bought that book. It, I had it, forgot it for last Christmas. It's a great little book. Okay, it's largest asterism. So, an asterism, as I said, is like the Big Dipper. I can draw the asterisms here. And for me, the largest asterism is probably the winter hexagon. Now, some people call this the winter G, and you start at the bottom of Sirius, and you go up to Rigel, and you can go up to Aldebaran, or you can pause and dart in and go to Betelgeuse. So mm -hmm. if you go to Betelgeuse, you may, that makes it a G. But if you avoid Betelgeuse and just go from Rigel to Aldebaran, you stick with the hexagon or the football shape. Um, this con this asterism is high in the sky during uh, Super Bowl season usually. So it's, I usually write about this as being the winter football and talk about it around early January. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Aldebaran, Capella, Castor Pollux, Procyon, and down to Sirius again. And the moon, the moon actually, the moon's orbit crosses through the winter football once a month during the, um, the winter time. So that's a cool one. All right. Now, here's where, here's a really fun one. You could argue that that is the biggest asterism, but I'm gonna give you an alternative view and that is from the Maori culture. And I'm gonna take mm. us back to Auckland, New Zealand. Show us, show you the sky in Auckland. Uh, let's see if I go to midnight, roughly midnight here. And I'm gonna change the star, the constellations to their cultural stars. So in here I have the star lore for Maori. Let's see if this works. This often crashes Stellarium, but we'll see if this works. Okay. So this, this is the asterism named Tawaka o Tamareti. And it's a waka in, in Maori is a canoe. And you can see that this, this is a giant canoe that stretches almost across horizon to horizon. Um, it's sailing the Milky Way. So at this time of the year, let's see if I can make the Milky Way a little darker. I'll just turn off the light for a second here. There's the Milky Way. So um, this is springtime in, in the Southern hemisphere right now. And so for them, the Milky Way is along the horizon. I'm gonna turn this, the um, horizon to the ocean. There we go. There we go. So now we are, we're, we're on a sea of water. And so the, the, the war canoe is, is actually cruising along the Milky Way for them. Um, this constellation includes uh, the Scorpius. So this is the tail of Scorpius. 
It includes the Southern Cross. So the Scorpius is the, is the prow. The Southern Cross is the anchor. The rope that ties the anchor to the ship is Alpha and Beta Centauri. They're called the pointer stars in the Southern Hemisphere. Then we have parts of Vela and Carina, which is your big Argo ship that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, then we also, and, um, and Pappas, all three parts of that are in here. We also have Orion. So Orion is down over here. Here's Orion's belt. And then we have Taurus here. And then we have the Pleiades up at the back. I'll swing it around so you can see it a little bit better. So there's Orion, mm -hmm. Orion's upside down. So Betelgeuse yeah. is at the bottom and Rigel's at the top. Okay. Kind of so, so, disorienting yeah, so, so Taurus and the Pleiades are kind of um, following along in the wake of the war canoe. Um, uh, way up here, we have, this is the star um, Alpha Eridani or Archinar. And this would represent the tip of the mast. And then the Magellanic clouds, which I don't know if you can see them here. Yeah. The large and small Magellanic clouds would represent the masts, the, the sails, the sails of the war canoe. And then finally, to top it off, we have the stars Rigel, which is here. He's re this, this person is driving the tiller, steering the, uh, the boat. Then we have Sirius, and we have Sirius and Canopus. And Sirius and Canopus, so Sirius is the captain, but Canopus, who was a woman, she's the navigator. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the lady has to, the lady has to navigate, right? That's the way it should be. <laughs> um, and just, just as a point of interest, so the uh, Pleiades in the Maori culture, they call that Matariki. And when Sirius first begins to be visible after sunset um, in, I think, June is when they have their new year. That's when they call it New Year's begun. We had a, we actually had, we're invited to a New Year's celebration and we sent it out by our um, yep. newsletter that goes out every week uh, for Maori astronomy. So that was cool. Yeah. So that's, that's Te Waka o Tamareti. I can actually send you a, send you a link to a information page that people can read up on that some more if they're interested. Um, the Stellarium usually crashes when I exit. <laughs> so just bear with me. <laughs> we have to restart. We have to restart. Yeah. Let's let's see if this works. And here it's done. I'm gonna go to Western. Is it gonna die? It might die. Uh oh. Okay, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> while, that, while that's restarting, I'll share the link in the chat. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where's my chat? Q and A. No, oh, that's not it. <laughs> more. I don't have a chat button. Anyway, we, I'll send okay. it to you later and you can yeah, always I'll, post it on the, the show page. Okay, I just sent a chat message so it should pop up as a notification somewhere on one of your pages, but um, if not, I'll just add it afterwards. Yeah, we'll make sure people get to it. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, okay. All right, let's get into stars now. So the brightest star is seen from Earth. Oh, that one's serious, right? No, wait, the sun. The sun. Yeah. Cheater. <laughs> yeah. The sun is magnitude minus 226.74. But yes, the nighttime, in the nighttime sky, <laughs> it's serious. Sirius comes up at this time of year, late evening, after midnight. There's Sirius coming up around 1 o'clock. But in another month or so, another one or two months, it'll be shining brightly in the sky. Um, Sirius is magnitude minus 1.46. Sirius is, is that bright largely because it's a hot blue white star and because it's relatively close to Earth. It's only nine light years away. Now, what's the most luminous star? What's the difference? So here's the difference. So you could have, you could be out on a road, on a, on a country road or a road in the, on, a, on a pitch black night and you could see two cars parked in the distance and their headlights could be the same. They look like they're the same brightness. But actually one car's headlights could be much brighter and it's much farther away. Right. I mean, you could, tell by the, you could tell by the separation of the two headlights, that's kind of a bad analogy. But basically two individual stars 
could look the same brightness, but one could be much farther away. It's just that it's, it's turned up brighter than the other star. So we call that luminosity. So the star that's brightest from our apparent, apparently how bright it is, the star that's apparently brightest in our sky is Sirius. But the most luminous star that we know of so far is inside the large Magellanic cloud. Oh. And it puts out about 6 million times more light than our sun does. Wow. It's a, it's a giant star. It's about 215 times the mass of our sun. It has a temperature of about 46,000 Kelvin. Our sun is about 6,000 Kelvin. It's called R136A1. Hmm, catchy name. Yeah. It's in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula. I'll show you a picture of the Tarantula Nebula. And I'll show you where that star is. So I, to those of you, a couple of people guessed Vega and Deneb. To those of you guessing Vega and Deneb, Chris never said in our galaxy, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So this is the Tarantula Nebula. This is a zoomed in view. I remember a minute ago, I zoomed in on those, pa those fuzzy patches in the Southern Hemisphere and said those were the, the sails of the Waka. So this is a little knot of, uh, not a little knot, but it's a, an intense knot of nebulosity inside of the large, larger of the two Magellanic clouds. And one of the stars in here, astronomers have found. So it doesn't shine brightest in the sky. It's just that they can tell by the amount of light coming off of it, that if it were as close as the other stars in our sky, it would be millions of times brighter than our other nighttime star, stars, skies. All right, so that's the brightest, the most luminous star. Uh, let's see. The most luminous star that's within the Milky Way is Eta Carina. Eta Carina is actually um, a star that's in the process of exploding in the Carina Nebula, also visible in the Southern Hemisphere. And in a telescope, it looks like two candle flames burning end to end. Ooh. And I'll show you a picture of that one too. The nickname of this is the homunculus. Oh, that's, wait, homunculus is that creature that had, anyway. I don't know, but yeah. I know that this is called the homunculus. So Cute. about three years ago or four years ago, um, when I went to New Zealand, I, was, I got to visit an observatory on a new moon, black as all get out night. And it was too windy to do photography. So we looked through their one meter telescope for the evening. And I looked at this object through the one meter telescope and it literally looked like, it, because it was windy and the air was turbulent, it looked like the two candle flames were flickering, like two flames wow. back, back to back. Unbelievable. So that's the uh, most luminous um, within our galaxy. All right. Largest star by diameter. So there's a star in the constellation of Scutum, which is visible in the night sky. There's Scutum. Scutum's above the teapot of Sagittarius. And this star is called Stevenson 2-18. And it has a diameter that's 2,150 times that of our sun. So what it, what's happened in this star is that it's, it's swelled up and cooled down. So it only has a temperature of 3,200, but it's, it's become this red, it's called an extreme red supergiant star. Ooh. Uh, it's about 20,000 light years away from us. You can see it in very big telescopes, um, but it's not an easy target. The one that the kids always raise their hand and tell me that the biggest star is, is called UY, uh, UY Scuti or UY Scutum. Mm, sure if yeah. Stellarium has UY Scutum. Let's see if it does. I've had, I've definitely had some students tell me that before. I think it's commonly expressed that way because no. of a graphic that was made a little while ago. Yeah. You can see, yeah, there are a lot of um, infographics that show it as being a giant star and it is. <laughs> Um, but there are other, other stars that are edging it up. It's again, it's science just keeps discovering more and new. All right, how about the, not the massive, but the most heaviest star? So the heaviest star that we think we know about is our friend R, R136A1 back in the large Magellanic cloud. Oh, really? Of the nebula. Yeah. Does that include neutron stars? I guess neutron stars are relatively light compared to other things though, right? Well, they're the result of a massive star that's, in, that's ended its life cycle. And in the process, it's actually thrown out a bunch of its mass. So Right. So they're dense, the neutron but small. Stars, yeah, would be, would be smaller. Still massive, but small. Mm -hmm. um, the most massive star that I found within our Milky Way is called uh, HD 15558, which is in the heart of the heart nebula in Cassiopeia. So if I go over to Cassiopeia here and zoom in on the heart nebula... 
So this is the Heart Nebula in Cassiopeia. And the star is uh, 152 times uh, the mass of our sun. Wow. All right. Now we know that stars are pretty much fixed in their places, but they are jostling around. And if you watched uh, a number of sessions ago, we talked about um, the summer, I think we talked about the summertime Milky Way, the most, the star with the highest proper motion. So that's the star that's changing its position in the sky at the highest rate of speed. Do you remember which one that was? Nope, not at all. It fell out of my brain. Anybody Is have? It? It's yeah. Barnard's star. Oh, right. Barnard's star, of course. Of course. Barnard's star. Let's see. Right, because it's, it's right. Yeah, I should have. Anyhow. So this Gotta is Barnard's star. Episode. Yeah. So Barnard's star is only 5.9 light years from the Earth. And things that are closer, we can see their motion a little bit more easily. So if I, if I pick another star in the area and I, and I lock onto that star and I jump ahead every year, I don't know if you can see it too well. Let's do a different one. Let's do this one. So this is Barnard's star with the label on it. Go back to 2020. So here we go. Here's 2020, 2021, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. And so um, that star is moving by about the diameter, about half the diameter of Saturn every year. That's a lot. So if you think about how big Saturn is in a telescope, that star is hopping about to a full Saturn um, width every two years. Here's, a, here's a, an animated GIF of the same thing that somebody took, showing it over a number of years. Oh, wow. You can, you can do this project. You can take a picture of it every year and then combine them together and make a GIF. Hmm. So that's Bernard's star. Okay, so that's the highest proper motion, but that's not the speediest star. So this, the speediest star that uh, we know of are one of the stars that are being flung around the supermassive black hole in the center of our Milky Way. Because they're being, they're being accelerated by the intense gravity field at the core of our galaxy. And that's going to be down here somewhere. Um, that star is called S4, S4714. It's close to the supermassive black hole. It's being flung around at up to 8% the speed of light, which wow. is crazy 8%? fast. Crazy 8%? fast. 8%? Is that what you said? Yeah, 8%. Eventually, it'll be sucked in and, and added to the mass of the black hole. However, another fast star is S5 8. HVS1, we're high velocity star one. It's speeding through the galaxy at 6 million kilometers per hour. And it, it was probably thrown out of the core of the galaxy by the supermassive black hole. So it got flung around and spun out. And now it's scooting through the other stars in the, uh, in the, in the galaxy. Uh, that one is in the constellation of Grus, or Grus, the crane. And we can only see it from southern latitudes, but it is. Um, it's zipping along as well. So that's cool. Okay, closest star. Closest star. Wait, I know this one. Um, Proxima Centauri. There we go, right? Yes? Proxima Centauri, correct. That star is only visible in the Southern Hemisphere. So if I hide the sky, hide the ground, I mean. Oh, there's Gruss. There's Gruss the crane, by the way, I was just mentioning. So, oh. so here's Centauri. Here's Centaurus and Rigel Centaurus is a triple star system. If you can see if I zoom in, it splits into two. And then Proxima is a third star, but it's so dim you can't really see it in, in Stellarium. So Proxima is slightly closer than these two. It's uh, 4.24 light years away. Um, you'd have to travel as, to as far south as Mexico to start seeing these stars above the horizon for us. Hmm. Um, it's at uh, Proxima's magnitude 11, and it's so close to these two that it gets overwhelmed by their glare. So it's a little bit hard to see it, but, um, but it's, uh, it's bright. That's close, that's the closest star. Hottest star. Hottest star is something called a Wolf Rayet star. And it's uh, number uh, WR102, it's in Sagittarius. I don't think I can show you that one from here. So Sagittarius is the teapot. So it's part of this constellation. And um, a Wolf-Rayet star is a star that's highly evolved. So it's finished 
fusing its hydrogen, finished fusing its helium. It's working on the heavier elements right now. And it's just about getting ready to supernova and active, um, emitting tremendous amounts of radiation. Um, astronomers think that this star is probably going to go supernova within about 1500 years or so. Um, but it's 29,000 light years away. No need to worry. Oh man, but no worry. Will we be able to see it at least? Um, probably. Yeah. I think we'd be able to see it. It's in our, it's within our galaxy. If it goes supernova, we'll be able to see it. Yeah. I hope to the thing about supernovas, and I've wondered this, I was wondering about this back when we were, we were looking at Betel, Betelgeuse dimming in last winter, mm -hmm. is what if Betelgeuse went supernova while it was in conjunction with the sun? Oh, that'd be such a disappointment. Right? Because in the summertime, oh. we can't see Betelgeuse because it's near the sun. So a supernova generally lasts, you know, a few weeks where it's really bright and then it fades over time. So there could be some that, a star that was there, then it went into conjunction with the sun, and then the next spring when it came back, it was there and it wasn't there anymore. So I was I was wondering if anybody knows of any any sort of historical records where a constellation changed and that might have been that the star went supernova. I'll I'll check with our favorite historian Randall as well. Yeah. Um, who seems to know everything about astronomy. So when I say hot, the star is um, remember the sun is six thousand degrees. This one is 210,000 degrees. That's hot. Wow. Yeah. That's very hot. Yeah. The hottest normal star that you see shining in the nighttime sky is about 30, 40,000 Kelvin. And this one is 210. So that's, that's hot. Now, the coolest star that is not a brown dwarf. So brown dwarfs are kind of failed stars. They didn't quite get their start. They didn't have enough mass to really... Uh, shine properly, so they're sort of um, warm, but not but not shining the regular the way a regular star does. So the star um, S Cassiopeiae is estimated to be very cool, have a temperature of only 800, 1800 degrees. So it'd be in Cassiopeia, and it's another one of these where the star has swelled up and cooled down. And if we traded places with it, we put it in our solar system, um, its radius would extend out to Mars. So that's how much it swelled up. Wow. Okay. So that, that's enough for stars. Let's talk about the solar system. Hold on. Linda asked if you could repeat what the hottest star is. Hottest star is WR102. Thank you. And WR um, stands for Wolf Rayette. R-A-Y-E-T. Right, yeah. Um, -E yeah, it's fun to read up on, on some of these topics. So I invite folks to, to do that. Okay, solar system. What do you think is the closest planet to Earth on average? Mm, on average. Mm. Mm. Venus? Mm. Mars? Mercury? Some people are saying, Colleen says Mercury? Well, oh, to, on, mm. to work it out, you'd have to figure out how far is it today. How far is it tomorrow? How far is it the next day? And do that for a year or a longer period of time and average all those together. And when you do that math, and I've got a website that I can, uh, I can give you to post to folks where they've done the experiment. It turns out that it's Mercury. Huh. So Mercury ranges, right yeah, Mercury ranges between 0.6 astronomical units and one astronomical unit is the Earth-Sun distance, right? So that would be 60% of that our distance from Mercury, that's the closest. And the farthest we ever get from Mercury is about 1.47 or 47% or more than an AU. Huh. But then the average is 1.04. And that kind of makes sense when you think about it is because it spends half its time nearer than us than the sun and half of its time farther than us from the sun. And the sun is one, so it's about one AU away on average. Mm -hmm. But now Venus can get within 0.28 AU of Earth, but it also gets a lot farther away. Mm -hmm. So it can spend a lot more time at dis distance. And so it averages out to 1.14. Mars can get, uh, Mars's average distance to the Earth is uh, 1.69. Hmm. And when you do the math, and, and this article that I'll share has a table where it has Mars versus Earth and Earth versus Mercury and Saturn versus all the others. So Mercury is the closest planet to all the other planets. 
Interesting. When you do the math <laughs> to huh. each of the other planets. That's wild. Yeah. I don't know why I wouldn't have expected that, but huh. It just, okay. like, it just seems anyway sorry yeah it seems strange for like uranus when it's so close to neptune for example but if it's so it's also super super far from neptune sometimes at times yeah yeah uh okay what's the farthest naked eye planet naked eye that'd be saturn right well some people argue uranus most yeah most astronomers will tell you that it would be uranus because in good conditions, you can see it. I don't think I've ever seen it, but I haven't tried too hard. Mm -hmm. But I should give it a try one of these days. On a dark, dark night when the sky is good and you figure out where it is, you should be able to see Uranus with your naked eye. Colleen um, says she's seen it and therefore it must be fact. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of those sort of more opinion, um, personal yeah. experience uh, questions. Um, Neptune, maybe... At opposition, I don't know, but I think Uranus is the safer bet, and mm -hmm. definitely, definitely, yeah, um, definitely Saturn. Yeah, that's that's why I think the days of the week are named after. Some of them are named after the five visible, five quote naked eye planets, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, most massive solar system object. Oh, the sun. Correct. Yeah, I almost forgot about the sun. Followed, followed by Jupiter. Yeah. Do we count Kuiper Belt or Oort Cloud? Well, as an individual body. As an Jupiter. individual body, yeah. Jupiter, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jupiter, the sun already contains 99 plus percent of the whole mass of the solar system, including Jupiter, I think. And then I think Jupiter <laughs> contains, you know, almost 100% of, of, the, of rest the rest. Of it. So it's, yeah, yeah. We're, just, <laughs> we're just the scraps, the crumbs. <laughs> okay. Largest moon in the solar system. Oh, Titan? Triton? Titan? Let's go back here to earlier evening. Where are we here? Oh, I got to go back to 2020. I've been sitting on 2029. Colleen uh, says go. Ganymede. Correct. Ganymede is oh. the answer. Why would they call it Titan if it's not Titan? Ah, well, because the moons are more named after a theme than after... Because we, you know, we didn't know a lot of their right, their right, physical right. characteristics when they mean when we name them. Okay, uh, so so Ganymede is number one at fifty two hundred and sixty eight kilometers in diameter. It's eight percent bigger than Mercury. That's wild. But it weighs half as much. Oh. And that's because Mercury is almost solid rock, whereas Ganymede is rock and ice, mm. so the density is lower. Uh, the runner up. After Ganymede is? Is it Titan? Can I say Titan yes. here? Yes. Okay, good, Titan. yay. <laughs> um, it's Titan. Titan is uh, is quite a bit smaller than Ganymede, but it's still, no, maybe that's 5,000. I think it's, yeah, it's just a little bit smaller than um, Ganymede. And both of them are still bigger than Mercury. So Ganymede and Titan are both still bigger than Mercury. Ganymede and Titan. Um, what do you think our moon ranks? Oh, I'm gonna say like 14th. It's fifth. Oh, really? Okay. Well, yeah, I'm clearly fifth. not the one to answer these questions. Colleen, what's your answer? Was it the fifth? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. The brightest solar system object. Now, obviously that's the sun, but what I mean is the, the one that's most reflective, the highest albedo, it's called albedo, the reflectivity, the object in the solar system with the highest albedo. I feel like the moon is pretty up there because it's made of basically aluminum isn't it well i mean the surface is some people are saying enceladus some people are saying venus because i guess venus because of the clouds enceladus because of the ice yeah it's all to do with with how reflective the surface of the object is or the clouds around the object is the answer is enceladus enceladus is incredible it's only 500 kilometers in diameter wow which is crazy it's so that's 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 a tenth the size of Ganymede, right? That's like wait, sorry, five hundred kilometers in diameter. Yeah, that's like driving to Montreal from Toronto. It's tiny. It's tiny. But it's it's ninety nine percent reflective. Wow. And that makes wow. it possible to see Enceladus all the way out beside Saturn in a back in a in a amateur backyard telescope. You can see Enceladus quite easily uh, because it's so reflective because it's uh, basically just a giant white ice ball, right? 
That's insane. That's cool. The next in line, the next brightest object in line, albedo wise, is the dwarf planet Eris. <gasps> and maybe, maybe Eris is covered with ice or something very reflective as well. Have we sent anything to Eris to look at it? No, but New Horizons has, you know, sort of tried to take data from Eris as it sort of flew by, but not, it wasn't close to it. Okay, someone high up in a space organization, if you're watching, I'd like us to go to Eros, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, the lowest albedo object in the solar system. Mm. And this is tricky because we get to a point where things are so dim we can't even see them, so. Right. Um, I can't think of like dull objects. No, I have no idea. Well, well think of more about a class of objects. Oh, asteroids? <laughs> Yeah, so the carbonaceous asteroids, okay. the ones that are sooty and black, they're quite dark. Um, they reflect about 5% of the light. That's not much. That's not much, yeah. Huh. Um, but they're much brighter in the infrared. It's because they, they absorb mm -hmm. the sun's heat and they re-radiate the infrared out. Right. So, so we, they can be very hard to see visually, optically, but we can see them with infrared telescopes. That's why we put up um, a lot of infrared telescopes, um, W first is the infrared telescope. Yeah. James Webb is going to be leaning towards the infrared end of the spectrum, and it'll be partly used to detect um, the small objects in the solar system. At some point, we should have like a, a Rask movie night where we watch things like Armageddon. I think that'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could tweet, yeah, tweet it or something. Yeah, live tweet. Um, <laughs> inert comets, inert comets, when they're not near the sun, they can be even darker, about 4%. Yeah, but the moon, our moon, is uh, comes out at, at a, an albedo of about 14%. That's way less than I was expecting. It's way less, yeah, except when it's full. So there's something called the opposition effect, and that is when you shine sunlight on a bumpy surface, it tends to reflect the light straight back at the source more, right. more advantageously. It's called the opposition effect. So, so an object will get brighter as it approaches opposition, and then it'll peak up in brightness when it's perfectly in opposition because of that effect. And then it'll sort of taper off again. So the moon, the moon is brighter than it should be when it's full at opposition. Okay. okay. Let's talk exoplanets. Ooh. The first... And bearing in mind, bearing in mind that this could change. If you're watching this a year in the future, right. this may be That's wrong. Right. <laughs> well, this one, this one won't, but the other ones will. The first exoplanet discovered orbiting a star. Yeah, that won't change. Oh, uh, no, I should know that. I have no idea. So there's a cool story about this one. So the first exoplanet discovering star anybody can see on a clear night in October, look for the great square of Pegasus. And when you look closely at the upper right edge of the square, there's a little star that makes a shallow triangle. That star right there. It's called 51 Pegasi. That is the star with the first discovered confirmed exoplanet. Um, originally, this, the exoplanet was given a nickname Bellerophon. In oh. mythology, Bellerophon rode Pegasus before Perseus. Oh, right. Um, okay. It's also, but, it's also a planet in Firefly, but could, yeah, yeah, here yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, have to, we'll have to add that. Next time we revisit our, our yeah site. we should yeah <laughs> but apparently the uh, the IAU have renamed it to Dimidium <clears throat> Ooh. and I'm not sure what Dimidium means I can look that up uh, so with the, so this is a hot Jupiter it it orbits its star every uh, 4.23 days discovered in October 1995 using the radio velocity technique that's the technique where you watch a star watch take the star spectrum. And as the star gets yanked around by a heavy companion, it, it wobbles and it moves forwards and backwards towards the Earth in a way. And we can see the motion by analyzing the spectrum. And it's called, and it, so we are able to measure the distance, the difference in the, the velocity towards us and away from us because of the heavy planet orbiting around it. I took However, a quick... go ahead. No, I just said, I was going to say D Dimidium or whatever the name was. I looked it up. Yeah, Dimidium means, is Latin for half, which was referring to the planet's mass being at least half the mass of Jupiter. Okay, go ahead. Perfect. Now over here, we've got Cepheus. We talked about Cepheus in a previous session. He's the husband of Cassiopeia, the king of Ethiopia. And let's see, get this right. 
So in 1998, in July, so that's, you know, years before the um, Bellerophon was discovered, Canadian astronomers led by Bruce Campbell, Gordon Walker, Stevenson Yang, they measured strong indications that an exoplanet was orbiting the star named Gamma Cephei. Hmm. So there's Gamma Cephei, it's the tip of the hat. It's a naked eye star, otherwise known as Eri. So that star is visible in the night sky, no problem. Um, their data wasn't good enough for them to risk publishing it, so they didn't publish. Huh. And so then they got scooped in 1990, um, oh. 1995. So we didn't, Canada didn't get the, the honor. Oh. Okay, but that's a... it's since been confirmed. Okay, good. So does that give it to us? I don't know. <laughs> I think yes. Also, I had a prof in undergrad. He used to call that essentially, if you think you have something, but you're not sure, he used to call it licking the pizza. So like you mention it to like claim it as yours before anyone else gets it. <laughs> okay. uh, all right. So here's where the um, here's where the, the answer is going to change. You know, next year, uh, largest known exoplanet. Ah. Uh, so we might have some exoplanet experts, or they might have an app, but I'm going to just tell you what it is. So it's the exoplanet's name is HAT P 67 and uh, 67 B. Mm -hmm. Uh, the exoplanets always start with B or C or D because the star gets the A, but we don't say A. And the first planet we discover around a star then becomes B, and then the next star is C, D, E, F, G, and so on. Um, so this star is 2.08 times the size of Jupiter, but it only weighs 60% of the mass of Jupiter. Another hot Jupiter star, uh, it would be a gas giant similar to Jupiter or Saturn, and it, it's orbiting its star um, in 4.8 days. So that's the largest one so far that we've detected. The closest known exoplanet. Is there one? Oh, we talked about this. We talked about this. Um, is it in, is there one in Proxima, around Proxima Centauri somewhere? Yeah. 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 So we've determined, we've confirmed that there's an exoplanet around Proxima Centauri. It's Earth-sized. Oh, cool. It's oh, right, yeah, that's why we talked about it. Yeah, it's only 4.2 light years away, so. Maybe, um, I think somebody. I think I read somewhere that the the exoplanet the the exoplanet would be much much older than Earth, billions of years old, older than Earth, so that perhaps uh, would no longer support life. Maybe the stars sort of baked it, baked away its atmosphere, that kind of thing. But uh, it's, that's fun to think about. And hey, our friend Barnard Star, it has an exoplanet too. Hey, the one with the, one with the high proper motion. We've got options, folks. Well, okay. that's a lie. Save the most Earth-like exoplanet that we know of so far. Oh no, Chris, you're asking a hard question. So that would be that would be a planet. Yeah, but there are folks watching. There are probably exoplanet enthusiasts that that know all this already, right? They that's can ram these off, Kepler, or blah 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 blah. <laughs> so, so the most Earth-like planet in the list, if you go and check the list, and again, it's going to change almost every few months. Um, those are the planets that are in the habitable zones of their stars. So they're close enough to the star where they're warm enough to, for um, water to be liquid, but not close enough for it to boil away. So not too far for it to be frozen, not too close for it to be boiled away, sort of in the, in the Goldilocks zone. Kepler 452b, and the Kepler stars, the Kepler exoplanets are the ones that were found by um, the Kepler mission. So they're the, all in that clump in Lyra, mm -hmm. a patch of sky in Lyra. Lyra being here. So the Kepler mission stared at the sky and just watched the watched all the stars and, and saw how they varied in brightness and determined that they had planets. So it's one of those. Um, it has many Earth-like characteristics. Um, it's about double the size of Earth and its mean temperature is about minus eight Celsius. So it's average global temperature, um, which is a little bit warmer than Earth's. Earth's global temperature is, um, minus 12 or something like that hmm. on average okay there was there was an article recently about the most habitable or like a super habitable earth um and so it might have been that one it's tricky because until until we can detect um whether there's an atmosphere whether there's you know water on the surface all that kind of thing we can't really be sure but mm -hmm. we can we can pinpoint the ones that are earth-sized 
and maybe orbiting their star in a, in a convenient, mm -hmm. you know, location for, for life to I, be. I know we only have six minutes left, but I wanted to throw out quickly that we do occasionally work with the Institute for Research on Exoplanets, and they are doing research where they'll look at the specific spectrum of light that is being uh, that is dipping when a star when a planet passes in front of its star when they're looking for a transit. And if it's in certain wavelengths of light, then they can, uh, more so than in others, then they can start to detect whether or not there are atmospheres and what the atmospheres are made of. So for example, if there's oxygen in the atmosphere um, and the, let's say blue, which is what um, oxygen reflects back, if blue dips earlier than red does in the spectrum, they'll know that the atmosphere started to cross over into the star's disk slightly before the planet and the blue, mm -hmm. and that it has the blue wavelength, which could be an oxygen, which is so cool. Anyway, sorry, it's amazing. back to you. It's wild, yeah. like, how do we know that? It's so cool. Anyway, back to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, our Toronto's own, Canadian, Canada's own Sarah Seeger, of course, is a world expert on exoplanets and she's got a book out um, and she's got, you know, several books out that are, that are great for folks that are interested in this field of study. So highly recommend Sarah Seeger's work. Link. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's only four, four oh, right. yeah, twenty six. Right? Sorry, we got it. We, we got, got time. Five. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot. We about got that. time. Yeah. Don't panic. <laughs> Everyone, calm down. <laughs> we got some more good stuff to come. All right. Space exploration. I'm not going to do a lot because there's so many things you could do with space exploration. But the farthest human artifact slash slash spacecraft from Earth at the moment is uh, Voyager two or Voyager one. Voyager one. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Voyager 1 is 148 AU from the Earth. I hope it's one. Hmm. That would, no, I'm not I mean, sure if it's no, I'm not sure if it's one or two. Somehow I, I thought it, it might have been two. Yeah, for some reason there's like a little thing in my mind saying it was actually Voy Voyager 2, which is confusing and strange. Yeah. Maybe I'm mixing up fastest and farthest. I'm not anyway. Well, it's one of the two. Voyager one or Voyager two. We'll we'll double you're, check that. You're but right. It's Voyager one. It is Voyager one. Okay. Yeah. It's 148 astronomical units which doesn't seem that far, 100, only 148 times the distance of Earth from the sun. Uh, it's also one of the fastest spacecraft, but there is one that's faster. Uh, the farthest the farthest object that humans have landed something on. Uh, landed something. Would that be the Huygens probe on? Yes. Yeah, yeah, on yeah. one of the moons, Titan? On Titan, yeah, in 2005. Yeah. So we got to go back. We got to go back. We, we so... want to land on Pluto, right? Do, have we actually, is there, are there any missions getting ready for that? Um, um, Alan, really so. uh, yeah. Alan Stern? Dr. Stern is, is pushing hard, yeah, for no, a, a lander from Pluto. Ninth planet thing, whenever he takes photos, yeah. <laughs> we should, yeah, Insider's Guide is, might be Pluto agnostic, I don't know. We're Pluto agnostic uh, because we have too many friends on both sides. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Uh, the fastest spacecraft. So it used to be, it used to be Voyager and New Horizons is up there as well. But at the current time, the fastest spacecraft humans have, have got going is the Parker Solar Probe. It's moving at uh, 153,000 um, miles per hour or 68.6 .6 kilometers per second. And that's 27 times faster than the fastest gun or missile. Wow. Because it's sitting around the sun. Because it's caught go. in the sun's intense gravity well, that's one of the reasons why it's moving so quickly. I was really hoping it was going to be the Tesla that's up <laughs> no. on Mars right now. <laughs> no, no, sorry. That's okay. All right. Now let's, we're going to get into the exotic stuff, the fun stuff. Okay. Uh, deep sky astronomy. Let's talk about deep sky astronomy. Okay. So the closest, uh, the closest star cluster. Uh, sorry, the closest open star cluster. Open cluster. Does the Big Dipper count? Because there's some theories that they're kind of like an open cluster, right? Well, it might count. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> but for this, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with the Hyades. Ooh. So the stars that make up the triangular face of Taurus the bull mm. is a big open star cluster. It's about 140, 153 light years away when that, that's what makes it such a wide patch of the sky. It's about uh, five and a half degrees across or about 11 full moons in diameter. Um, and by the way, Aldebaran is half as far away. So it just happens mm. to be in the line of sight. 
but all of these um, these various little stars around here are all siblings of one another. That's that's the Hyades. Okay, now the brightest open cluster, because these stars aren't particularly bright. So the the brightest open cluster is the Pleiades, which you talked about oh. with the Maori. So most indigenous uh, cultures of the world have seen something significant in these stars and have, have created uh, myths and stories and um, teachings around them um, because they're so, uh, they're so obvious in the sky and such a gorgeous object in the sky. So the, the Pleiades are about 40, 440 light years away from us. Uh, the next in line after that would be the Alpha Persei stars that are orbiting around or they're scattered around the star Murfak or Mirfak in Perseus, the OB moving association stars in Murfak. And that's all, this one, these are only a little bit farther away than the Hyades. Okay, the largest globular cluster. Hercules? So most of us, most of us know about the Hercules globular cluster, which is sitting here. But that's not the biggest one. The biggest one is Omega Centauri. Ooh. Oops, let me do that again. Okay, let me put it in here. Omega Centauri is in the Southern Hemisphere sky. If you ever get to go to the Southern Hemisphere, it's amazing. <laughs> you can see, you can, I don't know if wow. you just noticed, but the Hercules cluster was this big. And the omega one is many times larger. That's so this is, a, this is a definite naked eye object. It's a big fuzzy patch in the sky. It's about 15,000 light years away from us. It's about 10 million stars packed within 150 light year um, diameter. Um, but it might not be a globular cluster. It might be the core of a dwarf galaxy that had all its dust and gas stripped away and left its core. We're not sure. Mm. The jury is still a bit out on that. Uh, the next, the next brightest or the next biggest is 47 Tucani. Let's see if I can find 47. Tu the Tucani is the toucan. Aww. 47 Tuck. Here's that one. And you can, and it's right near the, Magell the Magellanic Cloud. It's also naked eye and it's a cool object as well. So that's the largest globular cluster. The brightest yes. nebula. Di hold on quickly, Diane Bell record, or has mentioned that if you can see Omega Centauri from uh, Arizona, if anyone's looking to see it. And yeah, it's, 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 like, um, it's like the, um, the pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri. If you can travel into the Southern continental um, uh, North America, you can start seeing some of these objects. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Uh, 47 to Cana. Okay, brightest nebula. Hmm. I guess I should ask what's the most famous nebula? Orion Nebula. Right, Orion Nebula, but mm -hmm. that's not the brightest one. Ooh. I mean, the North American Nebula is pretty large. Well, the brightest one, and the reason I stay here, so here in this view, here's the small Magellanic Cloud, here's the large Magellanic Cloud, which is kind of a dwarf galaxy accompanying our galaxy. If you zoom in on this, and this is naked eye, and this is amazing, binoculars and naked eye. There's this clump in the off to the edge of the Magellanic Cloud. That's the Tarantula Nebula, and that's mm -hmm. the brightest nebula. And I'll show you another picture of it so you get a even better picture of it. It's bright. It's pink. It's because stars are being born inside that that uh, that nebula. Hot, heavy that's star forming cool. region. Is that nebula sort of like our the Orion Nebula is to the northern hemisphere? Yes, except it's it's on steroids. <laughs> Just like the spiders and the snakes and things are bigger in Australia. That's <laughs> the nebulae are too. <laughs> same kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, this one in in diameter is let's see. Read that. It's about half the moon's diameter across. Wow. But then it extends beyond, right? Because you're getting a glow around it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Orion Nebula is a teeny, teeny corner of it. Uh, here's the Orion Nebula for those who would love that, and I do. So there's the Orion Nebula, not the same scale, just another photograph of it. 
So pretty though. Yeah, gorgeous. I would we're like to also, in. yeah, we're coming into Ryan Nebula season and yeah. you can see it from Toronto if you try really hard and you don't have lights shining in your eyes. So just a heads up for all of you city dwellers, find a dark spot and go and look for it. And you can certainly see it in binoculars, so. Okay, so let's go back into the evening sky here and we'll bring out the late evening sky. Actually, we don't even need to go late. Let's go back to a couple hours earlier. Here we go. Okay, farthest naked eye object. I know you know this. Farthest naked eye object. Oh, and this counts as deep sky. Uh, Andromeda galaxy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's the Andromeda galaxy. We've talked about how to find it in the past. I'm sure you and John have talked about how to find it as well. So mm -hmm. we, won't, we won't belabor that too much, but I'll just give you some fun facts. So it's two and a half million light years away from us, approximately. It's actually heading towards us and vice versa. So in about 4 billion years, we expect our galaxy and this galaxy to emerge in some crazy gravitational dance, which will probably produce a, a super galaxy at the end of the process. And it'll change um, our galaxy shape too, eh? We'll go from oh, yeah. galaxies into like an elliptical galaxy, like a blob more than a... a blob, galaxy. yeah. yeah. If, if, um, if a big galaxy swallows a little galaxy, then the bigger galaxy will tend to retain its shape. But if two equal size partners come together, then all bets are off. It, they generally end up being something, <laughs> a, blob, a blob or amorphous at the end of it. Um, the reason that this one's fairly easy to see is because it's oblique to us. It's sort of edge on to us, right? And so the, the light is concentrated into a, into a smaller area of sky, which means it's, it's a brighter patch of sky. It measures about six full moons across by about two or three full moons um, this way. Naked eye, easy in binoculars. You can, use, um, you can use the top half of Cassiopeia to point right to it. That's a, that's a good one to do. Mm -hmm. uh, let's now see. The other one is, so that's two and a half. The other one that people have claimed to be able to see naked eye is this one. Let's see if I can zoom in on this one. This is the mm -hmm. Triangulum Galaxy and it's more face on to us. So the light is spread out, so it's dimmer, but it's farther, it's 2.7 li million light years away. So if you can see it, then you're one of the few human beings with the superior eyesight that can, that can beat the record. Uh, some people claim that they've been able to see uh, galaxies called the Centaurus A, aka the Hamburger Galaxy. I'll see if I can show you. Really? That I question this. Okay. I've seen this one in a telescope. It's really cool. I'll just close the horizon. So in a telescope, it looks like um, two buns with the meat in the middle. <laughs> That's why they, it's called the Hamburger Galaxy. And also, I'll just bring up the night sky for Canada. Above the Big Dipper, there are two galaxies. Let's see, we can find the Big Dipper. This is not the best time of year to see them, but in this patch of the sky. So here's, here's the Big Dipper's bowl. And if you kind of come across the Dipper's bowl you, uh, obliquely, there are two galaxies here. And this is Messier 81. And it's, it's pretty bright, magnitude 6.94. So it's, um, so people have been able, have claimed to be able to see it and it's much farther. Where is that? 11.8 million light years away. So that's crazy far mm. for that record. Okay, last few things. Biggest known black hole. Biggest? Oh no. It's in the center of some galaxy somewhere, probably. The one in the middle of M67 or something like that? Yeah. yeah. So... This one is a more, a more of an obscure one. I think we need to go into the springtime sky. Let's advance into the springtime sky and go into, here's Arcturus, here's Virgo, here's Leo. And this is the Leo, sort of the Leo cluster of galaxies are in this patch of sky here. So here's the Virgo cluster of galaxies. Lots of galaxies in this patch of the sky. Um, this one's called T-O-N or TUN 618. It's in uh, Canis Venicidi. It's 66 billion times the mass of our sun. 66 billion. So our Milky Way's solar um, supermassive black hole would be several million times the mass of the sun. But this one is 66 billion, billion with a B, times the mass of the sun. 
um, the event horizon or the the size of the the black hole, if you like, um, would reach out to Neptune's orbit. Oh my God! If it was here in our solar system, That's so insane. it's enormous. That's insane. Um, but no worries, it's ten billion light years away. All right, everyone, calm day. down. <laughs> yeah. um, the runner-up is an is a, a massive black hole called Holmberg 15A. It's only forty billion, only forty billion solar masses. Um, Get it it's together. In a, <laughs> it's in a galaxy cluster called Abel 85 in the constellation of Cetus. So Cetus, we'll go back to the October sky here. So Cetus is here and that's in the southeastern evening sky. And let's see if you can bring up Abel 85. Is it in here? It is. So there, there is a clump of galaxies that are dim. They're sitting above the tail of Cetus the whale and that big heavy black holes in there. Okay, biggest known galaxy. Mm, biggest known galaxy. Biggest known galaxy. Oh, I have, I have no idea. I know it's in our, big. yeah, it's in our Virgo, sort of Virgo cluster area of the sky. It's a galaxy called IC1101. So IC1101 should be here. We need to get I don't know, like Buzzfeed on making a list of names for these or something. Yeah, nickname like Behemoth, Gargantua. Yeah. Like Gargantua was the black hole in, in Interstellar. So, yeah, there so you go. It. Yeah, let's see if I can get a, a Sloan Digital Sky Survey image of it. I don't know if anything will come up. Let's see if this works. Oh, here we go. There we go. So Stellarium doesn't show the object, but if you switch the Stellarium um, All Sky Survey on, then you can get a picture of it that way. So I see 1101. Uh, let's see, 100 trillion stars. So we think our Milky Way is a few hundred billion stars. So it would be, you know, almost an order of magnitude bigger. That's insane. And it's a billion light years away. So really far. Wow. Okay, finishing up, last couple of things. I'll turn off my thing here. Uh, the, let's see, the coolest looking galaxy. The coolest, coolest looking. Yeah, this is a I, kind of a subjective. Subjective. Look. I like the eyes, those ones that you can like see them pulling on each other. Yeah, in Markarian's chain. Yeah. yeah. In the springtime galaxy. What do you think? Um, oh, Sombrero Galaxy is suggested by Bruce. Sombrero's I like cool. the Sombrero too. Yeah. 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 Um, we can maybe go back and show some of those in a couple minutes because we'll see how much time we have left. Uh, for me, what I like, I like in Pegasus. I like peg this one because it's in Pegasus. It's called, where is it here? It's above the square. It's called the Superman Galaxy. Ooh. And let's see if I can find it. Also, while you're finding it, um, I also like that there's something called the Deerlick group. Um, but Colleen suggests the Needle Galaxy. Also yeah, the Needle Galaxy is neat because it's right edge on and it's it's fairly, relatively bright. So it doesn't take a lot of effort to see it. Here we go. I had it the wrong way around. It was at the bottom. So this is called NGC 7479. And I like it because it looks oh. like the <gasps> Superman, kind of like an S shape. That's awesome. Yeah. This is called um, a peculiar galaxy. It's called an ARP by a um, gentleman by the name of ARP who compiled a list of peculiar galaxies. So this is an ARP galaxy. Um, NGC 7479. Um, in, a, in an amateur telescope, and if you have good skies and good dark skies, you might be able to see it from Manitoulin. I think you should try. Okay. Um, you'll be definitely be able to see the the core, the upright core, and you'll probably get you'll probably see one or maybe both of the arms. Okay. A hint of them. A hint of them. So I'm gonna write this I think in my notebook. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And my other favorite one is the antenna galaxies in Corvus. In Corvus is a springtime. I'll open up a picture for you. And this is sort of a famous pair. Ooh. So these are two galaxies that are merging. And the cores are now tucked together, but the rest of the galaxy stars have been sort of left 
to fend for themselves or to eventually coalesce. But in the, in the, in the meantime, um, we, some people call these the mice and some people call them the antennas. Aww. And these are, um, these are also in our peculiar galaxy because of that. There's a really neat gif somewhere out there on the internet of, um, that someone put together of galaxies merging and they got pictures of various different galaxies at different stages of merging That's and kind cool. of put them in a timeline. Yeah, it was really neat. I'll see if I can find it and put it in the YouTube uh, description afterwards. Um, let's see if I could find where the shore people are. So that's NGC 4038. And I think that's in the springtime. Yeah. So after the uh, after winter, and we get into the spring, this constellation is tucked in here between Corvus the Crow and Crater the Cup. And it's in the southeastern horizon um, in late evening. So when it comes back, you can take have a go at that one too. All right, so now the last the last thing I've left is the galaxy most like looking in a mirror. Oh, I should know this one. I know we've talked about it. Oh, is it like the firework galaxy or something like that? Well, there are a number of candidates. So we astronomers believe that our the shape of our galaxy is um, a barred spiral. So that means that we have, it's a spiral galaxy, a disk with arms, but the core, rather than being a sphere, it's elongated, like a little stubby stick, tapered stick. So there's a bar with the arms around. And the galaxy that astronomers think are much like ours, one of them is this one. It's in the Southern Hemisphere sky. It's called NGC 6744, and I've shown this before. You can see that it's got an, a core that's a bit elongated. And then it's got several major arms wrapping around. So that, I think this is visible in telescopes, amateur telescopes, but you need to be in the Southern Hemisphere to see it. The one that I, when I did my research that people mentioned was in Pegasus. Let's see if we can find this other one. And it's called uh, UGC, UGC. It's something like UGC. a university, universe, something, something galaxy catalog. One, two, one, five, eight. Mm, that doesn't seem right. Oh, I must oh that's one, 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 five, eight. Yeah. UGC. Two, one, five, eight. Did I spell it wrong? You got it there. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So it's down in here near our friend 51 Pegasi. Stellarium, it's so dim that Stellarium doesn't have a picture for it. But if I bring up the, um, the deep sky, all sky chart photograph, you'll see it. And what's cool about this one is that it's edge on, it's face on to us. Ooh. So give it a That's second. That's a pretty one. It's still, it's still loading okay. the internet, sucking the data down. <laughs> so, We'll just, we'll just let that um, sharpen up while it wants to. And that's all I had in my list of world records. Does anybody have any suggestions or things, requests? <laughs> there are a few minutes left. Yeah, we can look up some extra ones if anyone has any, like, uh, I don't know if the smallest is the easiest one to go or the smallest object detected by in space detected by humans, who knows? I don't know. If you have suggestions though in the next couple of minutes or questions, uh, please do send them in. I did miss one. Actually. What'd you miss? I missed, anyway, there you can see the galaxy there. I missed, what is the farthest away thing that an amateur telescope can see? Ooh, ooh, that's a really good one. I don't know. So that would be a quasar. <gasps> so a quasar is a quasi-stellar object. And what we think it is, it's an active black hole. So it's a black hole that is sort of in the process of consuming something. Mm. Um, so it's producing, here it is here. So it's producing intense amounts of visible light radiation. Um, so this quasar 3C273 is in Virgo. It's 2 billion light years away. 
So wow. remember, when you look at the Andromeda Whoa. galaxy, that's two and a half million. When you look at um, the, the, the eyes or M87 in Virgo, that's 60, 70 uh, million light years away. This is 2 billion light years away. So you can see this in an amateur telescope. Um, it, would, it would look like a, a faint magnitude 12.8 bluish star, but it's actually the light coming off of a black hole. That's crazy. So it's, it's near this right. other star, but uh, it's called Quasar 3C273. How bright so, is yeah. it again? Do you know how bright it is? Sorry, I'm sorry, I missed that one. That's cool though. Uh, magnitude 12.8. Okay, yeah. This okay, does, doesn't say here, but in my research, I found it was um, 12 point eight. Okay, good to know. That's wild. And I know that quasars give us a lot of information about sort of like the early beginnings of the universe, eh? Yeah, we, you know, basically now we, they're basically the supermassive black holes in the cores of galaxies that are just busy radiating intense amounts of radiation and light. So, um, this is by no means the only quasar. There are lots of further ones that we can, we can see. The further back we look, the, for, the more deeper into our past we can, uh, mm -hmm. we can understand. So, yeah. The coolest thing about looking at space and doing astronomy is it's like time traveling. So what was everybody's favorite? I mean, that's, that was sort of a variety of records. So far, um, everyone's saying their favorites are you. <laughs> oh, oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for watching. We really do appreciate the positive feedback, and we, we're so glad that you're enjoying the presentations. I think my favorite was Bellerophon, but that's because I really, really like Firefly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was disappointed when I heard they changed the name, but that is sad. Yeah. But the neat thing about astronomy and astronomy outreach is that. We, the, we still have the stories. We can still share the stories and the fact yeah. that the official name has changed. It doesn't matter. Like, okay. um, like Eris and, Dis, and its moon, and the dwarf planet Eris we mentioned earlier has a little moon called Dysnomia. Dysnomia I think it's Dysnomia. Oh, it's a great name. But when Mike Brown and his, and his collaborators discovered it, they named it Xena and Gabrielle. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that was sort of their code name for it. That's very cool. Um, Swapna asked if uh, will be if you you or I or someone will be posting a list somewhere of all the stuff that you did research on. I don't know if you want to give up all your secrets to the next person so that they can do this show. <laughs> so let me. I found the uh, chat. Let me just share the. Uh, here's the Maori War Canoe information link. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else do I have that I could share. Here's the article on calculating the average distance to the planets with the table at the bottom of the page. This is a cool one. And yeah, I think that's basically it. The rest of it is, you know, you can use Wikipedia um, and certainly you can play in Stellarium and, um, and see where things are. Perfect. I'm gonna wrap up uh, our show with one last thing, which is not at all Guinness World, Guinness Record related, um, but from Byron in the YouTube chat, uh, the NASA OSIRIS-REx landing is going to be broadcasted at 5 p.m. They're landing on Bennu, um, and that's very exciting. So, if anyone I heard it was six o'clock, but maybe it's changed. It might be five o'clock their time. So it's at it's in the evening tonight sometime. I don't have any resources on it. I Handy. think it's I think it was six six twelve p.m. Eastern time, but okay, maybe they're starting the live stream at five. It's possible. Yeah, the live stream is at five. That's right. Okay. Um, okay. Every oh yeah, that's in seven minutes. Okay, time is yes, time is marching on. Thanks everyone for joining us. If you do want to go and join that live stream, uh, give it a Google and we may see you there. Otherwise, reminder, we're taking a break in two weeks and then we'll be, we'll be back again in, uh, on November 17th. You won't, if you're already registered for this, you won't have to register again. It'll, it'll keep your registration over into that time period. I'm thinking we might, we might want to do meteors and meteor showers and meteorites. I'll see if I can find a special guest for that. That'd be cool. And we'll talk. And we'll, we may, if we do, if we ever talk about satellites, I might have a special guest for satellites as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chelsea. Yeah, Jenna and I, have, <laughs> Jenna and I have, have been, we've got lots in our bag of tricks. So, so stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned. We'll see you all awesome. soon. Um, if you're watching Explore the Universe, our last session for that is also next week. So 
Um, we will see you there. We will see you on the internet. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again on the 17th. Absolutely. Keep looking up and so you can send us your suggestions if you have ideas as well. Yeah. Susan, we do take requests. Here. We do. <laughs> <laughs> take okay, care, gang. everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.